so yeah, I'll dive right into it. Um, there's many different types of two-factor authentication that combine something you know and something you have. But in this research, we focused on time-based one-time passwords, or TOTP, which is a widely adopted method of two-factor. We've heard some talk of that today already. And some of the largest sites online support this method of two-factor. So Google Authenticator, shown here, is the most commonly used TOTP app with over 100 million installs on Android alone. And as you can see in this uh, screenshot, the, these types of apps show periodically rotating one-time passwords. Typically, every 30 seconds or so, they'll rotate to a new value. And users need to enter this value into uh, the browser when they're logging into their account. So for those who aren't familiar with these kind of apps, I'll go over some of the basics that are helpful later in the presentation. So when someone wants to set up TOTP two-factor on a website they use, they're shown a QR code by the website, and they're asked to scan it with a TOTP app on their phone or other trusted device. Now, this QR code contains three key pieces of information that get shared with the app on the phone. The first is a secret that's generated by the website. And this secret is used by the app to generate the unique one-time passwords for that user's account that are required to authenticate. The name, and the, the, the name of the website and the account username, which is typically the user's email address, are used within the app to visually indicate which one-time password goes with which account. So if the user loses access to this shared secret stored within the app, then they will not be able to generate the one-time passwords required to log into their account, and they could potentially get locked out. This is much easier than you might think. If you purchase a new phone, or your phone is lost, or broken, or stolen, or even if you accidentally uninstall the app, you could potentially face lockout. Fortunately, there's many apps that implement TOTP, and many of them offer backup mechanisms to help users avoid this outcome. But I had the question of what security and privacy implications might there be to users who leverage these backup mechanisms? Um, and this was really understudied, so we set to find out. There's three main research questions that we tackled in this work. The first is what personal information, if any, is leaked when utilizing these backup mechanisms? The second is what's the risk of an attacker obtaining one of these backups in the first place? And if they are able to obtain one of these backups, what's the risk that they might be able to compromise it such that they can read the plain text TOTP secret? And again, anyone with this secret can generate valid one-time passwords for the user's account. So how do we go about this? Well, we identified all of the general purpose TOTP apps in the Google Play Store, and we filtered for apps that had at least 100,000 installs and offered a backup mechanism. There were 22 apps that fit this criteria, and you can see the specific versions of each app that we looked at in table one in the paper. For each of these 22 apps, we took the following actions. First, we recorded plain text traffic, specifically while adding, backing up, and recovering TOTP accounts. And while we were doing this, we used a custom QR code that had unique values so that we could then look for those values later in the network capture. For apps that utilized encryption as part of their backup mechanism, we performed a crypt analysis to determine which crypto primitives were used and how they were configured. And because most of these apps used cryptography for many different features, we couldn't make the assumption that our observations were correct. We had to actually prove this, and so we implemented the decryption process for each app in a separate Golang script. And the input to these scripts would be things like the backup password we chose, or the encrypted backup that was sent over the network that we obtained from the network capture. And the output of these scripts would be the plain text TOTP backup. So I'll highlight some key findings, and I'm gonna be speaking in the past tense here, not only because the research is complete, but we started over two years ago, we completed it over a year ago, and new versions of apps certainly have a changing landscape for how these apps potentially work. So which mechanisms were available? Um, first is the ability to manually transfer your TOTP secrets from one device to another using QR codes. And this is really secure because it doesn't utilize the network of any kind, but it presents a big usability challenge because you can easily forget to do that. The most common backup mechanism was cloud-based backups that stored something in the cloud in some fashion. 
There were seven apps that allowed users to export their secrets from the app to a local file on the device. And then, of course, that file could be shared just like any other file on the device. And some apps specifically allowed the user to share their TOTP secrets and other information directly from within the app using the standard Android sharing menu where you could select like text message or email or other apps that are supported. And finally, there were nine apps that could send the TOTP backup to the user's Google account using the native backup capability of Android. So this graph shows the number of installs impacted by each backup mechanism. And the first thing you'll notice is the orange bar for QR codes is by far the most with 101 million installs minimum. But this number is drastically skewed by Google Authenticator, which at the time had 100 million installs and intentionally didn't support any other backup mechanism other than QR codes. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus mostly on our findings related to the apps that supported cloud backups, which impacted almost 80 million installs. So though TOTP two-factor is often promoted as more secure alternative than SMS two-factor, we actually found that particularly because of these cloud-based storage mechanisms, TOTP backup mechanisms in general ended up placing trust in the same technologies that TOTP was meant to supersede or improve upon, which was passwords, SMS, and email. There were four apps that relied solely on SMS to authenticate the user during the recovery process. And this means that an attacker with control of the victim's phone number, potentially through a simple SIM swap attack, uh, would be able to access that TOTP backup. Uh, you'll note uh, SASPass is one of these apps, and unfortunately, SASPass was also one of the two apps that sent plain text backups, including the secrets, to the app developers. There were 15 apps that supported encryption for backups, but most had serious cryptographic flaws that made the ciphertexts of the backups vulnerable to trivial offline attacks. So first, let's talk about how the keys are generated. 14 of the 15 apps that supported encryption for backups derived an encryption key from a user-chosen backup password. Now, Microsoft Authenticator was the second most installed app that we reviewed, and it was actually a unique case because it was the only app to create encrypted backups without deriving keys from a user-chosen password. And instead, it retrieved a randomly generated key from a Microsoft-controlled key server. And we'll revisit this in a minute. For the rest of the apps that did derive keys from user-chosen passwords, a weak password that can be easily guessed is gonna result in a weak key and contributes to um, offline attacks. Unfortunately, most apps had severely inadequate password policies. You can see on the left here that most accepted passwords for the backups with less than eight characters. Some even accepted just a single character. Very few followed best practices to help encourage users to choose stronger backup passwords. For example, only one app utilized a strength meter and very few utilized any kind of block lists. Most apps utilized weak key derivation algorithms and or configurations. Uh, on the good news side of things, there were three apps that used modern KDFs that are both CPU hard and memory hard, but the most commonly used KDF was PVKDF2. Uh, which is only CPU hard. And that contributes to some of the issues with vulnerabilities to offline attacks, especially if it's configured with a weak number of iterations. And unfortunately, that's what we found in every single app that utilized PBKDF2. The maximum number of iterations that was configured in one app was 160,000. Um, for reference, OWASP recommends several hundred thousand iterations in the password context, uh, password hashing context, and here, where we're deriving an encryption key, we would want even significantly more than that. So even though the encryption keys that are derived should never leave the device, there were four apps that sent both the encrypted backup and the key or the password from which it was derived to the app developers. And of course, this means the app developers have the technical capability to decrypt the backup and read the contents, including that TOTP secret. Um, and this is where we come back quickly to Microsoft Authenticator. So as I mentioned before, they don't derive keys 
from a user-generated password, but they get a key from a Microsoft key server. However, the Android app also stores the encrypted backup in a Microsoft storage service. And surprisingly, Microsoft has publicly documented that the iOS version of the app stores the ciphertext in iCloud. So we asked about this, and Microsoft unfortunately didn't respond to our questions asking why they chose a more robust architecture for the iOS app, nor why the Android app did not leverage built-in Android backup services to store the encrypted backup on Google servers instead of Microsoft servers, which wouldn't help um, so that Microsoft would only control the key and not have access to both the key and the encrypted backup. So how are these keys used? Well, again, with the uh, good news first, there were five apps that used AEAD encryption algorithms, which do provide built-in integrity. Uh, there were five apps that used AS CBC, which does not provide integrity by default, and unfortunately, most apps did not use a Mac, so there was no in integrity of any kind. Uh, most concerningly, there were three apps that used ASECB, which is deterministic and shouldn't be used in production projects. So in addition to uh, security issues, we found several privacy issues among the apps we analyzed, but I only have time to highlight one that I think is particularly important. There were some apps that encrypted the TOTP secret, which is great, but they chose not to encrypt other fields like the issuer and the username. So for example, users of the Authy and Zoho one-auth apps who enabled the cloud backup mechanisms were unknowingly sending the app developers the names of the websites and services they used and their usernames for their accounts on those platforms. So I'll wrap up with a couple of recommendations. And the first is that TOTP apps should really encrypt all of the fields, including the username, the name of the website, and the secret, in order to protect the privacy of the user. For apps that did derive encryption keys from user chosen passwords, the first recommendation is encourage them to choose stronger passwords. In addition to improving the minimum length for the password policies, leverage block lists and strength meters um, to try to move the needle in the right direction. Never under any circumstance should these apps allow the backup password chosen by the user to leave the app. And once the key is derived from the backup password, the password should be wiped from memory and the derived key should be stored in the Android key store for future use. And ideally, this would leverage secure hardware where possible. And finally, we definitely want to use a key derivation function that's both CPU hard and memory hard. And in the paper, we recommend using Argon2, since it could be dynamically configured to take as long as possible. And we actually propose 30 seconds as a floor for how long the user would actually wait. And while this sounds like a long amount of time, there's actually some prior work that suggests people will tolerate a longer delay if they're given an explanation for how it protects their security. So we need future work to explore this in more detail, but um, it's an idea we present in the paper. So responsible disclosure is particularly important when developers and applications can actually improve and address issues that we found. So we contacted the developers of 14 of the 22 apps to report substantive issues and gave them at least 90 days to respond to our report before we submitted our paper to Usenix. Um, unfortunately, six ignored us, um, but we did hear from eight, and unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the details of those responses here, but I would love to talk to you um, about it afterwards. So the last thing I'll highlight is that everything we've done is open source, including the decryption scripts for each app, the steps that we took in each app while recording traffic, and so I'd encourage you to go to the GitHub repo that's available online, not only so you can verify our work, but we make the tools available to help you reproduce it on your own as well. Uh, so with that, I welcome any questions if we have time. Great.